Hi, I'm Walter Metz. I'm a professor in the Department of Cinema and Photography in the College of Mass Communications and Media Arts. Uh, and I'm very happy to have been invited here to talk about research in the arts and humanities. Uh, I have served on the uh, REACH grant uh, selection committee for a, a bunch of years. Um, and I have a long history with undergraduate research. Uh, I went to MIT in the 1980s and was a materials engineer. Uh, and I did Europe. Europe is uh, the foundation of this sort of program. Uh, I worked with an electrical engineering professor who was an assistant professor at the time. He's now the president of MIT. Uh, and so the first thing that I need to convince you of uh, is that you're not taking advantage of a research university unless you're bothering your professors all the time. Uh, and then you will have no idea what professors you should bother. <laughs> uh, so you should bother them all uh, and then sort them by whether they're nice or not. Uh, and you hang around the ones that are nice that can teach you something. Uh, but it's always better to err on the side of bothering people than not bothering people. It's what you're paying tuition for. And if they're going to be jerks, it's not your fault, right? Um, I've been teaching UCall 101 for seven years, some here and some at my previous university, Montana State University. Uh, and one of the things I do in my class is I really push students in their freshman year to get started. Uh, in the sciences, even if you're washing dishes, uh, it's a good thing to be washing dishes in someone's lab. It seems dumb, but what they're doing is they're seeing how well you wash, wash the dishes because what they want you to do next is start doing the science work. I was just listening to NPR um, and this guy that's doing uh, research into MERS, the Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome, uh, told the story in the middle of this interview about researching MERS uh, that that's how he got started. They're like, how did you get interested in science? He's like, I don't know, I was working in some guy's lab washing dishes. Uh, so quickly, if professors trust you, they'll have you do all kinds of interesting things. Uh, so let me tell you what I do with my students. So I teach UCall 101M, it's the mass communication section, and I have all the film majors. Uh, and so I told the students, if you want to make a movie, here's all the production professors. If you want to think about how film works, uh, do it with me. So one of my UCall students last fall uh, worked with me. I'm in the middle of reinventing film criticism. Um, I find popular film criticism atrocious, and I find academic film criticism boring and unreadable, so I want something in the middle. Uh, and so I have this radio show on WSIU on Friday mornings. And so I told the student, I will give you a crash course on how to think about criticism. You will practice writing criticism with me, and we'll put you on the radio. And so sure enough, she started. She's a pretty good writer. Um, you know, got like a high B or something in my UCall 101 class. Um, so not like the greatest writer ever. Um, but every week, she came in with a new review. And I'm like, think about this. Um, read this. Revise it in this way. Uh, and by May, she was on the radio, right? So the first step for you as research rookies, um, you get here, you take UCall 101 in the fall, uh, and then in the spring, you can be working with a professor. Uh, so this is the way in which a state research university like uh, SIU is set up. You have to take advantage of it. Uh, then the next step uh, is something like REACH. Um, these are bigger awards, um, and they are awards that students do uh, working in, quote unquote, labs of professors. So I've been asked to talk about the arts and humanities, and what you need to know is that if you're interested in working in the arts and humanities, the stuff that I do, I'm a film historian, uh, it's okay. Uh, the application is a bit off-putting uh, because it's built around, so what are your research methods? Um, these are very common things. If you've ever read a lab report um, in high school, it's got five things. An introduction, materials, methods, discussion, conclusion. That's kind of what the form is built around. Um, so all you have to do is translate those things into the kinds of things you want to do. So I'll show you today how you can translate it in two ways. I'll tell you about the work I do as a humanities researcher. I write books for a living. 
uh, and I'll tell you what my students do, which is they make movies. Uh, so the thing is not called uh, the Committee for Undergraduate Research. It's called the Committee for Undergraduate Research and Creative Activity. Uh, and that really matters for us in the arts and humanities. Um, a research university uh, is about the generation of new knowledge and its dissemination. That is the basic foundation mission of any research university. Lots of creation of new knowledge in the sciences, right? Can we cure cancer? Um, lots of generation of new ideas in film. I think new things about films all the time, and I'll tell you one of these projects that I'm working on. But it's also about the dissemination of information. Uh, so I used to teach at Montana State University with a science filmmaking program, and we had all the science filmmakers partner up with scientists. Uh, and they wrote them into their research grants uh, because the NSF and the NIH and these other big science research and grant agencies uh, have an outreach component. And that outreach can be things like websites where you need video content. So they need science filmmakers. So I want you to think about the way in which the kinds of things you want to do fit into the larger mission of the university uh, and know that all you have to do is wedge yourself in. Uh, and then I've sat on this reach committee for many years and we are desperate for proposals from the arts and humanities. So one of the reasons we have these sessions is we want to encourage you to apply for these things. Research Rookies, uh, REACH, um, McNair is a wonderful program for minority students. That there's all kinds of things that the university has to provide an infrastructure for undergraduates doing research. If we had a magic wand and could generate a pile of money, every undergraduate at this university would be doing research with their professors. That's what the university would do. Um, it's just when you have 20,000 students and 700 professors, that's hard to engineer, right? Okay. So let me do my presentation and then I'll save plenty of time for us to talk about things you're interested in. Um, but I just want to tell you about this book that I'm writing. It's called Molecular Cinema. Uh, and the place I want to start uh, is that the kinds of work I do as a humanities researcher who writes books uh, is mirroring the kind of work that my students do making movies. Um, so if you're interested in the intellectual lineage of this idea, there's a foundational cultural studies researcher, Stuart Hall, and his essay is called Encoding, Decoding. And what he suggests is that the production of a text is encoding uh, and the analysis of a text is decoding. Uh, and so what we do in a classroom in the humanities whether it's what I do, film, or what a literary scholar does with a novel, is we figure out how the novel is put together, and by doing that, we're figuring out what the novel means. Um, these parallel processes means that something like creative activity, the production of artworks, uh, and traditional humanities research analyzing artworks um, are the same thing. Uh, and what I tell my students in class, because there's a few that want to be scholars like me and there's hundreds that want to make films, I say this will be the material that we study in this class. If you want to make a creative project or write a paper, I don't care. Uh, and that's because I want the students to work in the area of expression that they came to school to learn. It's not that I don't want them to learn how to write, uh, but if they're really good filmmakers, there's no reason they can't make films to interrogate the ideas that I'm trying to teach. I teach this course called Film Production Theory because film students hate film theory. They're like, why do I have to take this? So I'm like, you have to take this because you can't make films without theory. There's no music students that don't take music theory before they compose stuff. Uh, and so, the students fight me, and I'm like, this is the way I'm going to stop you from fighting. We're going to study theory that's chosen because it is obviously and directly applicable to the making of films. And then I say, once you've considered it, once you put it in your intellectual orbit, I don't care if you reject it. And they don't believe me, and I keep hammering at it. The best film ever made in film production theory was a guy took the 10 books in my class. I have an inordinate amount of reading in all my classes. 
laid them out on the street, and ran over the books with a car. Brilliant. I'm like, I think I know what you think about these books. He's like, you think, right? But that act of creativity, even though it's anti-intellectual and destructive, um, was at least an engagement. I can't turn people into film theorists. What I can do to undergraduate students is put it in front of them and do my dance so that they know how important I think it is. And then if they reject it, I'm not bothered by this at all. Okay. So, I'm sitting around teaching You Call 101 last year, where the special topic was water. Uh, and so I gave a lecture on the physics of water, right? Like why it's a, got a dipole moment. Um, and the biology of water, like because water floats when it freezes, we're all alive. Every other molecule made of atoms in that position on the periodic table sinks. Sulfur dioxide, for example. If we were sulfur dioxide beings, we'd be dead. <laughs> right? Because the fish stay alive even though the water freezes. So there's something exciting about water. And what one studies at the university is completely immaterial to why water is exciting. So I did science, and I did the economy, and I did all this other stuff. And of course, I showed lots of movies devoted to water. So Chinatown is about the siphoning off of the water rights in Los Angeles in the 1930s. Maya Deren's At Land uses the notion of the feminine ocean to explore female sexuality. So what's water doing in all these movies was the question I asked. In the middle of the class, I don't know, about a third of the students were right there with me. A third were gone. They're like, I don't know what you're doing. I don't care. But the middle third I was concerned with. They're like, why do you care so much about water? I'm like, I don't care about water. I care about the material world. And I said, you could teach it on anything. They're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, we started the course with Aristotle, believed there were four elements, earth, water, wind. Like, it could be a class about wind. It would be different movies, it would be different science, but you'd need all of the tools of this university to understand it. And at that moment, it dawned on me that something I'm really interested in over here and what I was inventing here were the same thing. As a guy with an engineering degree who's now a film scholar, I am fascinated by the connection between science and film. Uh, and it's poorly studied. The scientists are all like, why are these science films so terrible? By which they mean they don't communicate science very well. Indeed, they often don't understand science. Uh, and then from our point of view, the science films are terrible because they're not artistic documents at all. <laughs> they're like some boring guy droning on and on about, I don't know, how the memory works or something. So the project for me is how can you infuse science film with artistry, um, and at the same time, how can you infuse it with science? So I don't care about science more than art, and I don't care about art more than science. I care about both of them. If they're not doing both things well, then they're not good science films. Right? Okay. So I've done all this research. I have three articles. I taught in the science filmmaking program for a decade. Um, but one of my research areas is I study the relationship between science and film. And I noticed that what I was doing with this water business uh, was replicating a new approach to science and film that I'd been working on for 20 years. Um, and so I thought the way of getting at this would be to say, okay, it's not just water, which is the coolest molecule. How many molecules are there in the cinema? And of course, the answer is there's as many molecules in the cinema as there are molecules. So you just pick the coolest ones to write the book. So I'm sitting watching Breaking Bad. I'm like, crystal methamphetamine, that seems like a thing and water, and the most important one I want to talk to you about is salt. This is Mark Karlansky's Salt, A World History. Uh, salt is a very simple molecule, right? Sodium from this side of the periodic table and chlorine from this side of the periodic table. You put it together and you get one of the most important things on the planet. Human beings can't live without it. Uh, the Romans used it for money. 
Um, and indeed, it invents Western civilization, right? The idea that you're going to put spice into food invents the modern world because people in Asia have spice um, and white people are wandering around the world looking for things like gold and they discover that gold is not gold but it's spice. Right? If you're a nurse, and this is a great book by Wolfgang Schivelbusch. Wolfgang Schivelbusch is the most important cultural study scholar in the world. Um, uh, his book about spice is Tastes of Paradise and he does this big long thing about how the spice trade invents the modern economy. Okay, so the point of this is I want you to see that being interested in how the world works. So, you know, there's all these books. There's a book about longitude. Deva Sobel wrote a biography of Galileo. Longitude is a nonsensical concept. Latitude makes sense because you're at the various places in relationship with the angle of the sun, so it's cold up there and it's warm down there. But longitude is an intellectual construction. So what I try to teach students um, is be inquisitive about the world and be inquisitive about every little detail that you think is stupid. Like longitude, why would I ever think about longitude? Because it's really crazy. And it did things like organize time zones. Time zones are not a natural fact. They're an imposition of human society, and they don't matter until the late 19th century. Um, because you've got trains wandering around running into each other because no one knows what the hell time it is. So people are like, we should have time zones. The notion of time zones starts to be enforced around the 1880s. There's no need for time zones unless you have trains crashing into each other, right? Okay. So you have to do research. That's why the title of the talk is Research in the Arts and Humanities. It doesn't matter what you're doing, you have to know things to do it. So if you want to make a film about salt, which I'm about to get to, or you want to write a book about salt, which is what I'm doing, you're doing the same thing. You're reading Kurlansky, right? Okay. And I'll just push at one more idea here before I go on to the art side. Um, the philosopher Martin Heidegger is interested as a phenomenological philosopher in the way the material world works. Um, I need Heidegger to write my book. So 20 years ago, when an undergraduate professor said, Walter, you should read Heidegger, and I sat there reading Being in Time, it's incomprehensible. I cursed, like, why the hell would I have to read this? Later, you discover, oh, I see why. Because we have a finite set of good ideas about the what the relationship between the ideal and the real is. Plato is the most important of these, but Heidegger is pretty important to the 20th century. What Heidegger says is there's an earth and a world, um, and one's the ideal and one's the material manifestation. The cinema is a magic machine that mediates between the two. So I'm on this committee with all these really smart teachers and one of them studies trees. And I said, so tell me what kind of trees you care about in the cinema. And he looked at me, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, well, think of a movie that has really cool trees. He's like, oh, Forrest Gump. And so he's going, it's about set in the south, but it's not shot in the south, so the trees aren't right. The cinema doesn't need to be tied to the real in the sense that those trees aren't accurate. And yet when you watch the movie, they seem like trees. That tension between the true and the false is what Heidegger is after. It's what my book is after. So when I say this chapter will be about salt in movies, we don't know what that means because the relationship between the real and the ideal will constantly be ratcheted through. It can mean incredibly different things in incredibly different contexts. But notice when I asked the tree guy from the forestry department, John Schoonover is his name? Yeah. Um, he, you know, if you wander around and look at trees, they have labels because the students in his class are like scanning QR codes to find out about these trees. 
If you ask me, the reason I asked the question was I was being churlish. The Tree of Life, Terrence Malick, really important film, Heideggerian filmmaker. He's like, oh, I didn't see The Tree of Life. I'm like, it has the word tree in it. <laughs> so artistic values lead you to some films. Forrest Gump is the most loathed film in academic film studies. It's based on this novel by Winston Groom. It's about how stupid Americans are because they don't know history. His character in the novel is a joke on America. Robert Zemeckis, one of the most important conservatives in Hollywood, gets a hold of the novel and completely de-ironizes it. It's good that Americans don't care about history, are simple-minded, because that's what makes us special. That's the argument of that movie. And it's Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is not playing a guy you're supposed to hate in Forrest Gump. But when you read this novel, you're supposed to hate him. You're supposed to loathe the him in yourself. So, the fact that we got between Tree of Life and Forrest Gump is of extreme importance when you collide a tree researcher and a film researcher. They're seeing the same thing in very different ways. And I want to show you how powerful this is, not for the study of films, which is what I do, humanities research, but for the making of films. Okay? So here's where it gets exciting. This is my colleague, Cade Burcell. She's an experimental filmmaker in my department. This is her film called Salt Line. This is the effect. <coughs> Get in there. there. This is good for you. So it's about five minutes long. It's a handmade film. She put a camera in front of plates of salt crystals and was playing with different layers of the image to edit it. And her film is about salt. It's not the kinds of things that Kurlansky is talking about salt. It's not about the Romans and the use of salt as money. It is about what does salt look like in cinema. So this is the changing of registers. The ratcheting through. So what could salt mean in cinema? One thing it could mean is physical beauty. When you shine light through salt, beautiful things happen because it's crystalline. That is a creative project. Now I want you to notice that her creative project and what I'm doing with it are not the same thing. This is one of the most important analyses in my book. It's inspired by a film from the 1960s by this experimental filmmaker, Stan Brakhage. Stan Brakhage is perhaps the most important filmmaker ever to hold a camera. Uh, he's the great god of American experimental cinema. Worked from the 1960s into the noughts of the 21st century. Just died maybe five years ago. Made something like 500 films. And you're like, geez, he must have been fast at it. No, not fast at it. This film, Mothlight, that I'm about to show you, um, took months to make. His uh, magnum opus is an experimental feature, which is very strange. It's 70 minutes long, called Dog Star Man. It was made in 1964. At some points in the film, it has 10 layers. So he had to shoot the 10 layers, and then he had to process them together. It took forever because he was doing it on optical printers. He couldn't put them in a computer in 1964, right? Okay. So this is Brackage's film, Mothlight. This is about four minutes long. I want you to look at a frame from Mothlight. Brackage is 1963. Brackage is obsessed at the moment with Jackson Pollock and abstract expressionism, right? Drip painting. Um, this is the closest that Brackage images get to anything that looks abstract expressionist. Um, so what is Mothlight? Well, the most important way that art scholars talk about it um, is that it's an attempt to bring abstract expressionism, Pollock's drip painting, into the cinema. 
It doesn't work like Pollock, but it produces images that end up looking like Pollock, non-representational, most importantly. But that's not why I talk about wreckage. When people come up to me and say, hey, Walter, I heard you on the radio. What's your favorite film? It's a preposterous question. It's like asking a chemist, what's your favorite molecule? I like nitrogen. Oh, I like oxygen. It's a preposterous question. <laughs> I'm a chemist. I like all molecules, because they work with the sort of intricacies of quantum mechanics. <laughs> I like all films. You put me in a movie theater, I am happy. I don't care what the film is. Student films. I just saw Interstellar, astonishingly brilliant. <laughs> Terrible film. I just saw Sex Tape the day before. <laughs> sex Tape, Interstellar, it's all the same. They're beautiful movies. <laughs> Putting anything in a movie is an act of wonderment. It takes millions of dollars, and God knows how anything ever gets shot. Because the people running Hollywood are, you know, care about money. And that's the last thing you want artists near. So it doesn't matter what the process was that the film got made. That the film got made matters to me. Okay? All right, so the reason I say moth light, and they say, why? So I show it to them, and they're like, I don't get it. It doesn't have Tom Hanks in it. I'm like, it makes Tom Hanks redundant. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, the cinema is a death and life machine. So I show a film from 1895. All the people in the film are now dead, but they're alive to you. Again, that's the Heidegger. There's something real about them. They were walking around, but they don't look like that now. They're desiccated in the ground somewhere. So what moth light does is how it's made. He took living moths and killed them, squashed them onto clear film leader. Moth light is a film that's never seen a camera. He didn't need to expose film stock and develop it to make moth light. He took the leader and squashed the moths between them and twigs and other kinds of stuff and then re-photographed the leader and projected that. So moth light is a film that completely challenges what we think a film is. What's a film? Oh, well, you need a camera, and you need to put stuff in front of the camera, you run the camera, and you develop it. That's not true of moth light. It is a frame shift, or in psychology, a gestalt shift. We see the world from a new point of view when we watch moth light. And indeed, thematically, it's one of the most important things that cinema does. It preserves that which will die. Think about why people take home movies. There's kids, and you know they're going to grow up. And I'm psychotic about this. When I run the camera, that's all I can think of, death. Probably not healthy, but theoretically correct. Right? Um, so Mothlight is a film that interrogates this. These moths were dead. I killed them. In real life, they floated around, but they wouldn't look like this. This is two-dimensional, for one thing. They would fly in three dimensions. But I used Brackage, I, Brackage, used the magic of the cinema to bring them back to life. It's one of the reasons why cinema's obsessed with things like Dr. Frankenstein. That's what the cinema is. <laughs> you don't need a lab in Transylvania to do this. <laughs> Soon as you turn on a camera, you are taking that which is dead and bringing it to life. Right? Okay. So what we have here is an example of what I started the little talk with. Encoding, decoding. I'm interested in decoding what salt doing in a movie. Cade, by making salt lines, is interested in inventing a creative project that tells us about the world around us through salt. These are mirror images of a very similar project. We are pressuring material reality to figure out what it does. So this is what I do in my classes. And I want you to know that if you want to do the humanities part, you come to professors like me and say, I have an idea. I'm interested in geology. I'm like, good. Here's all the things I know about cinema and geology. Go read them, and we'll talk about a project that you're <coughs> going to write about. 
but, and so I want you to apply for a REACH grant if you want to do that kind of stuff. But I also want you to apply for a REACH grant if you want to do creative projects. And so I want to get to the point where I tell you about one of my students who got a REACH grant, $1,500, and he built a set. So this kid's name is Austin Wood. He graduated, I think, two years ago. He made a 20-minute film, which is crazy for an undergraduate student. It's about this astronaut up in space, and he's not getting home. So he's about to run out of supplies, uh, and he's going through the crisis of grappling with his own death. Let me just show you what the film looks like. About 18 minutes of the film was shot in our soundstage. SIU, for reasons I cannot explain to you, um, has the best audiovisual production resources in southern Illinois, in, in the bottom half of the state. To get anything like these facilities, you'd have to go at least to St. Louis. Um, so we have a soundstage. It's smaller than what they make in Hollywood, but it works exactly the same way. There's an audio booth connected to this big empty box where you can control light and sound. He took his $1,500 that the university gave him because he went through this process of applying for a REACH grant, and he built a real set. It is worth its weight in gold for educators. So our students come and they take classes from me and they're like, how are you teaching me anything about the real world? I'm like, well, I'm teaching you more about the real world than you realize. But it's really nice to have this to demonstrate it. Um, so, you know, I was the department chair. Um, you go out on fundraising trips. So our fundraiser takes us out to Hollywood and we meet with the alumni who work in the industry. One of our alums, James Chrysanthus, was shooting The Ghost Whisperer at the time and said, come on to the set. So we get shot at Universal. We get to Universal. It's like Fort Knox getting in there, right? It took us like three hours to get to the set. <laughs> Giant studio, like the size of this floor. <coughs> and you walk in this giant room like this, all the way around the edge, because everything else is wooden walls, and inside, that was the season Ghost Whisperer was set at a hospital. The entire hospital is reconstructed so the camera can wander around this massive space. That day, we didn't move more than 15 feet because they were shooting the same scene again and again at the little nurse's desk. But what that is in big size is what this is in microcosm. That is, Austin built this spaceship with wooden walls, and then you point the camera through all the places, you cut little holes in the walls so that you get the entire movie. That's worth its weight in gold. These kids made a Hollywood film that happens to be 10 minutes long. The inception of the project was he comes into my office and says, I'm making this film, here's my script, about this guy up in space and he's dying. I'm like, well, what do you think it's about? He's like, I don't know. Death? I'm like, yeah, what do you know about death? Like, let's find out. Turns out this was like shooting fish in a barrel. Death is one of the things I'm obsessed with as a scholar. But you've got to read Kubler-Ross, right? The Five Stages of Grief. It's a famous book about death. In any ethics of death class, that's what they make you read. And so he begins to build the script around what's the character arc of this guy? Well, 
Kubler-Ross's five stages of death, that's a thing. We know that that's how people behave, so he puts it into the movie. When he writes the REACH proposal, he says the equivalent of me going into somebody's lab is I'm going to do research in how death works, and I'm going to use that to make the film different than it would have been without the research. That's the academic component of his film project. That's what gets you the REACH grant. I want to do this artwork. Okay, what's it got to do with research and creative activity? I need to invent a new camera because I can't make the film with the cameras I have now. That's a thing. I'm going to read all these books to rewrite the script to make the film better. That's a thing. Ratchet your project through to figure out why do I need the money and what does the money have to do with the research creative mission of the university. As long as you do that, you can get the grant. It's not going to read or feel the same as a science grant, but it's just as fundable. No one should believe at a university that one thing is more important than another thing. And students say this to me all the time. You don't save people's lives, Walter. You're not a doctor. I'm like, the last thing I would want to be is a doctor. A doctor's like a mechanic. <laughs> that's an ear infection. That's an ear infection. If you forced me to be a doctor, I would want an MD, PhD. That's a degree where you can do research. That I would like to do. But we have preconceived notions about what's important. Um, and what my work is about is to see that the cinema impinges on the real world, on the material world, every bit as doctors do. No, I'm not saving lives. But that overvalues what saving lives means, and it undervalues why are lives worth saving. And those are the logics of the arts and humanities. So, how do you do this? And this is my big capper. You think, oh, art school is just a bunch of blowhards like Walter going on and on. No, we have methods just like science has methods. The equivalent of the scientific method in the art world is ideation. So, how do you generate ideas? So let me take you through a one-minute version of a process that took me with Austin months. So you build categories, and there's all kinds of theory behind what this is. I won't bother you with it. But here's a kind of practice that you can do with artists. So what's your idea? I want to make a science fiction film about the future and it's only going to have still black and white photographs. Okay? So this is the grid that I reverse engineered from this film. It's a famous film, La Jetée. If you know the film Twelve Monkeys, it's the film that Twelve Monkeys is based on. So here's just a particular section in Chris Marker's La Jetée from 1962. This guy has been projected from the future because it's been destroyed by World War III. And they're trying to get him to time travel in a way that he can go in the future and get resources. The reason he's able to do it and all the other people die is he falls in love with this woman in the past. sequoia tree covered with historical dates. She pronounces an English name he doesn't understand. As in a dream, he shows her a point beyond the tree. He hears himself say, this is where I come from. And falls back exhausted. Then another wave of time. So one of the reasons you want to research to understand film is the bit with the tree comes from an Alfred Hitchcock movie made four years before, Vertigo. 
these characters in Vertigo stand at a tree, um, and it's an allegory for history in that movie. Um, that moment is being quoted by Marker. This is how artists work. They get ideas from other artists. The great thing about 12 Monkeys, if you, know, you know this Bruce Willis is the guy? Um, they go to a Hitchcock retrospective in the middle of 12 Monkeys, which is based on La Jetée, and they watch Vertigo. That's the complexity of that movie. But what the ideation grid does is it says, OK, I've got an idea. So what am I going to do with the idea? So you just invent categories. Well, wh what are my possibilities? So artworks are genres and aesthetics and length and what do I want to make and are there characters and what will the ending be? And then once you build the com columns, you just fire out ideas. It doesn't matter whether the ideas are any good or not. What are all the aesthetic possibilities that I can think of? It's going to be out of focus. It's going to be all canted angles. The top line is what resulted from the ideation project of La Jetée. I'm going to make a film that only has black and white photographs. Its genre is going to be science fiction. It's 30 minutes long. It's going to be a movie. There's only two characters, a guy and a girl, and it ends in death. So what you do as you build the ideation grid on the other side, like when you're starting a project, is you say, oh, of all these things, that's what I want. Of all these things, that's what I want. Um, and this is a process that takes the chaotic world of art making um, and makes it coherent. It fits it into the logic of a research university. How can you take control over these things? Well, just like scientists are being creative, like, well, what if I take that idea and use this experimental method? Um, this is what artists do. Well, what if I didn't make a movie? Well, what if I made La Jetée into an opera? New and wonderful things happen. Science is very constrained because it has to work the way the material world works. Um, art is less constrained. That it has to engage somehow with the material world, but it can do all kinds of things that science is not constrained by. And there's a logic of defending the arts over the sciences. The very thing that makes the sciences important, they allow us to know how the material world works, are also their limitations. But they can't transcend them. So interstellar, I don't know if you've seen this thing yet, but it's a perfect example of this. It's all kinds of quantum mechanics nonsense. So scientists watch Interstellar and they're like, ah, this is all made up nonsense. Because the film wants to do things like get to the future. Like get human beings from here to another galaxy, which by most scientific standards is really difficult to understand how you're going to do that. By the time you got to another galaxy, be billions of years the thing that we know as humanity would no longer exist. But the tension between these things is what's wondrous. An ideation grid that produces interstellar has to leave the physics of space travel behind. Some films, 2001 and Interstellar, are more interested in this than other movies, Star Wars. But that's the decision that one makes putting the creative project together, and that's what you would write about in your REACH grant proposal. Okay. So I've blathered all long enough. That is my summation of what I know about arts and humanities research. I would love to field questions, both practical and theoretical. So I will stop talking. Mm -hmm. Always if you have a sound of research, you always you are looking for one is such proper. Mm -hmm. So what problem are you solving? Right. Yes, that's it our starting point. Mm -hmm. Because this problem is it good, who solved this one, or how big is it, etc. Uh -huh. And in the in the humanity, why do you start in one? Mm -hmm. So when you start the research, why do the person test 
right? Yeah. I don't think it's different. Um, I don't think I would frame it in terms of problem, um, but various humanities disciplines are delimited by various objects. So there's a parallel, physics, chemistry, biology. Um, but probably not a good parallel, but something's going on there. But film, sculpture, music. So when you become a film scholar, you want to know how film works. That might be the equivalent of the problem, how do I keep the bridge from falling over? But we're dealing in analogous thinking. It's not going to line up, but it might have something in common that would be useful to us. Um, but that's the way I start with the world. How does this weird thing, the cinema, work? So who are the people that came before me that tried to understand it? So you read those books, histories, theories of film, um, and then you begin to contribute to that conversation. The problem is that the conversation is not cross-checked by the empirical methods that we have in the sciences, right? So it is difficult but possible to cross-check scientific theories, so evolution, for example. Geez, the same ideas are showing up across so many disciplines. That's a theory that begins to get to the level of law. Stephen Jay Gould's thing. Stop talking about evolution as a theory in law and start talking about it as a scientific fact because it is confirmed by consilience. Many different disciplines working in completely different registers get to the same point. You cannot get this without evolutionary theory. So we don't have anything like that in film studies. We've got ideas that relate to one another, but they don't build together into theory in that scientific sense of empirical research. And indeed, the notion of film theory is a really bad choice of words. I always describe it as theory with a small t rather than theory with a big T. The theory with a big T is actually producing things that scientists would define as theory, verifiable, for example. So we know cold fusion, you know, these people, Pons and Fleischmann, sort of, we've got cold fusion in a mayonnaise jar. No, you don't because no one else could replicate it. So what goes on in film studies is very different. It starts with the same thing, like what is this thing cinema and how does it work? Um, but the people behind us are not empiricists. My, my favorite um, literary critic is Leslie Fielder. He says, the purpose of criticism is to say as many interesting things about the text as possible. And that's not the purpose of scientific theory. Interesting things are not important in science. <laughs> are they true or not is important in science. So different values will produce very different outcomes, but I'm not sure the starting point is where they differ. The problem in your terms of film studies is how does film work? Um, and there's all kinds of ways of answering the question and they're not going to be consilient. So the major method in film studies is psychoanalysis, a defunct science. Like Freud's essay on the uncanny was built out of five case studies. If you tried to publish an article, um, what's your N? Um, five, <laughs> they'd laugh you out. Like, no, we're not publishing your article. Go back when you have 10,000 more people. And indeed, if you take a psychology class, an empirical psychology class, they'll talk about Freud for maybe three seconds. There was this guy, Freud, he was historically interesting, but we are cognitive empirical researchers. Um, so that doesn't mean that asking questions that psychoanalysis poses for the cinema is not interesting. For one thing, the cinema of the 20th century was built on psychoanalytic assumptions. Whether it's true or not might not matter as much as that people in the 1950s thought it was true. So we need psychoanalysis to understand American movies of the 1950s. 
European movies of the 1950s. But then along comes cognitive psychology. Hey, look at the way the brain works. Neuroscience, look at the way the eye works. Now this is a place where I wouldn't want to defend my discipline all that much. Not enough film scholars care about how vision works neurobiologically. That seems preposterous. And that's because of the very deleterious effects that the arguments between the sciences and the humanities have had. Humanities people saying, no, we just don't believe in your empiricism, and scientists saying, who are these lunatics that don't believe in empiricism? If we use Fiedler, we could get to somewhere less destructive. Reading Freud and learning how the eye works will get you different information about how film works. And indeed, it's possible that they won't be consilient. We're not expecting the big T theory of evolution to generate out of film studies. But that doesn't mean that we're not learning all kinds of wondrous things about how the cinema works. Will it ever collapse into something that is predictable? No. And indeed, I don't want it to collapse, because as soon as humanity's work collapses, it's occluding other things that would tell you a lot more about the world than the method that everyone seems to appreciate. That's the problem in psychoanalysis right now. When the neuroscientists come, um, the humanities people circle the wagons. And that's always bad for learning. <laughs> Intellectual wagon circling, bad for learning by definition. So there's all kinds of wonderful questions. But your idea, like, so what's the problem? The problem is, how does film work? In the same way that chemistry's problem is, how do elements work? Um, I think the problems come later. So what claims are we making about our solutions, quote unquote, to those problems? Um, film studies is not interested in solutions. Science has to be interested in solutions, particularly applied science, which is OK, so we know um, how Moore's circle works to figure out the stress and strain on a piece of metal. Um, that, that would be useful to know if you're going to build a bridge. Because if the bridge falls down, that's very bad. The equivalent of a film falling down, much less bad. So we can play more in the humanities that we can play in the sciences. If you play in the science, um, you better make sure you're doing it on a computer. Uh, and not with somebody's family driving over a bridge in a car. <laughs> bad things happen there. We don't want bad things to happen. Other questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, very beautifully how your, your background is science and your, you know, you <coughs> arts and science together at the same time. Personally, I believe that art existed because science has a definition. But um, I'm an accounting major, and I was trying to make that link, like if I'm looking at filmmaking, and not necessarily from the business side of it, but from my background. It, you know, I, you kind of touched the nerve there, but I couldn't put my finger on it. How would you approach something like that? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I think I would start to talk about what do numbers mean in accounting? So for people in the humanities, um, something like numbers are problematic because they reduce the world. Um, for people in the social sciences and the hard sciences, numbers are the only thing that will allow us to convert what we know about the world into something that we can manipulate. So I actually think this is one of the places, what does a number mean? Uh, that if you wanted to gather everyone at the university together to try to fix what ails us, which is we're all in these colleges fighting over money when we should all be in one room trying to figure out, so what, what would knowledge look like? How could we have more knowledge tomorrow than we had yesterday? Um, so I think this is what I would start to think. So when you're accounting things, the numbers are standing in for very complex systems. Um, and for many purposes, um, it's perfectly fine to let those numbers stand in. Uh, so when I balance my checking account, either there's enough to pay the rent or there's not enough to pay the rent. Like there, the reductionism 
of numerology is not important. Um, but, you know, what we do in uh, mass communications and media arts, there's social science researchers that ask these kinds of questions. But I deliberately didn't talk about them here because there's other sessions devoted to social science. But the dean of my college, for example, is one of the premier children's media researchers in the world. Um, and she would have a very different sense um, of how you approach the meaning of something like television. I approach it from purely humanistic points of view. She approaches it from social science points of view. How many people of color are in the show is one of the things that she's interested in. And what does it mean that no matter what the intentions of the TV show, they're always centering whiteness as the normative? To get that work done, she has to count the number of times white people and people of color show up in a children's television show. Um, so she's more comfortable than I would be about what the numbers are metaphorizing. Um, so it's not even possible in the disciplines to start to sort out, so who's comfortable with numbers and who's not comfortable with numbers. At some level, we all need to be comfortable with numbers. <laughs> That the invention of mathematics is one of the great things that human beings were able to accomplish. If you don't believe me, um, sit down with your kids and explain to them zero. Zero is what, there's a great book, Charles Seif, it's one of these books. Zero is a crazy idea. <laughs> like, how many apples do you have? Well, there's an apple, that's one. I added another apple, that's two. So what if you don't have any apples? That's zero. It's a conceptual invention that is one of the great technological forces of Western civilization. But then negative numbers are even more interesting. So if you have two apples and I take three apples away from you, how many apples do you have? And watching a little kid go through, uh, not only do I have no apples, but now I have less than no apples. <laughs> it's a wonderful kind of thing to watch kids go through. So these number systems are powerful because they explain things. So if you got another apple and you had negative one apples, it's mean you're going to have to give somebody your apple. You're not going to have the apple. <laughs> but at least you'll be to zero. So that when you get another apple, then you'll have the apple. <laughs> um, so I would approach accounting from that point of view. Um, that an accountant, by definition, has to overvalue um, the numerical system. And humanists, by definition, are undervaluing it. We're not asking questions about the numbers of things that happen in the cinema because we think they reduce too much. Um, and accountants, by definition, say um, they reduce exactly the right amount, right amount so that I can you know, explain how the economy works. Um, I want to live in a world that Fiedler understands. Say as many interesting things. The social scientists and the hard scientists will be more interested in saying, but we want the things that are predictable and verifiable than I am. And that's fine. I don't want the world to work without accounting. <laughs> like, the university wouldn't function unless we know how much money do we have and how much money can we spend on this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> but the problem is the answer is always not enough money. <laughs> But I, I think that's the way I would approach something. Um, you know, business, economics, these are social science disciplines uh, that are interesting because they straddle. So the argument was always the two cultures, science and art. Um, sociology is a kind of third culture. It's got its foot in both places. So some of the social science disciplines I'm more interested in others. Sociology largely because people are involved and people matter to cinema. But I think business is another kind of way of understanding what the middle between these things might look like. Um, there are people in economics trying to use game theory to build predictable systems of how things like the economy works. They're largely unsuccessful, but that is a scientific empirical attempt to understand the world. Um, and, and then there are people um, in the critical side of economy studies, of economics,
that are very much interested in you know, chaos and other things that humanities folks are interested in. Yeah, I've never thought about that. That's really interesting. <laughs> we have students doing business degrees for very practical reasons. The thing that you sent to the side, which is, if you're going to be a filmmaker, it'd be good to be a business major because you don't want to get all your money stolen from you. you know, like <laughs> that's the way in which business typically shows up in, in our disciplines. Right. Right. That producing is a very important thing to teach. And almost no one that goes to film school wants to study producing. And yet that's where all the money for making great art resides. So students ignore the producing part of the things that you can do, directing, writing, at their own peril. <laughs> It's very interesting to look at from a business point of view to look at a humanity or a social issue, not as not a, not as a businessman, but with those tools, mm -hmm. right? With the businessman tools, right? I find it sure. So, so you know, the thing that the humanities people say about Hollywood is no one knows anything. That's William Goldman is a screenwriter. He wrote a book. That's the first line of the book, um, which is true. But why don't they know anything? So. We have some sense that, geez, people really like action movies. <laughs> so things that blow up, as opposed to things that are funny, play around the world much better. So we know if you've got a movie where something blows up, it's going to make more money than a movie where something doesn't blow up. But then that turns out not to be always the case. So look, I made this movie where things blow up. It's supposed to make a lot of money. It doesn't make a lot of money. I don't know, Ben Affleck and Jiggly or... Ishtar, like there's all these movies that were massive amounts of money invested, um, complete disasters. Um, so we know something, um, but the little that we know proves out to be very dangerous because we begin to make decisions that seem to be based on um, sensible systems. And if anyone was able to fully get the numerical strategy so that it wasn't reductive, they, they controlled the entire world because they'd know, I'm going to invest my million dollars in this movie because it's going to make a hundred million dollars. If you could do that flawlessly, you'd control the entire world. You'd have all the money in the world, essentially, right? So the fact that the, once you get humans involved in the material world, everything turns chaotic. You have no idea what people are going to do, what, what people are not going to do. James Cameron's Titanic was almost not funded. Any individual studio said, you want $200 million to make a movie? He's like, yeah. So two studios almost bankrupted themselves to release Titanic, and then that turned out to be one of the best business decisions ever in Hollywood. But if you look at the Entertainment Weekly while Titanic was being made, Cameron was being laughed at. This movie is going to sink, was the joke. They built a seven-eighth set of Titanic in California. It just seems like a preposterous thing to do. Um, so many teenage girls go to see Titanic, it makes well over $500 million the year it's released in the United States alone, which means it makes about $1.5 billion around the world and through ancillary markets by the second year of Titanic's release. So what seemed like a really crazy investment, right? The average blockbuster was making between, well, a really successful blockbuster would have made $200 million in the United States. So then you're just hedging that you're going to get the um, foreign markets back. It's about double what's in North America. And you're going to get another double through ancillary markets. So if your movie makes $200 million, then you'd be fine. But they're like, what if Titanic only makes $40 million and we spent $200 million, 40, 80, then you're starting to think about losing $40 million, which no studio has the capital to do. Right? So there's a perfect example of if you had a science, you'd be able to know, and no one knows. Everyone thought it was going to fail, except for Cameron and the people that backed the movie, um, and then they won the lottery. Right? <laughs> What's that? Mm -hmm. Oh, right, onto, onto the boat. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> Didn't work out so well for him, I guess. Yeah. Have you tried to 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. Other thoughts, questions? I'm so glad you came. Yes? You, you seem to be even talking about starting from the question of how does this work? Mm -hmm. um, so once you sort of have that question, you're good to go. Before you have that question, what's, there's so much stuff that you could research. You could research anything in the entire world uh -huh. from films to tarantulas. Yeah. How do you pick what you research, <laughs> and then how do you design, okay, how do you get to, I'm going to study it through these books, mm -hmm. and how do yep. you do that? Uh, crazy, chaotic trial and error. So, you know, what I tell my UCall students is that the first thing is you need to listen to yourself. So that implies you have to know who yourself is. <laughs> so going to college is the whole point of it, right? Like, I'm a person that decided to go to college. So the first thing you do is I'm going to take full advantage of it. So I'm going to go join RSOs, and I'm going to play a sport, and I'm going to take music lessons, and I'm going to do these classes. Um, what classes you do, a lot of weight is on you right now. It's actually completely inconsequential to your long-term future. <laughs> most college students change their majors three times. Um, most adults in this economy change their career three times, right? I studied quantum mechanics, and I'm a film professor. Quantum mechanics is completely useless to me as a film professor, except that it taught me how to think. <laughs> so, you know, you put a lot of pressure on yourself, like, God, I've got to pick the right classes. Just take classes. It doesn't matter what classes you take. <laughs> um, because 20 years from now, all you will have needed would be skills. Did you learn how to write? Did you learn how to speak? Did you go to things where you ask questions? So there you got the check mark already. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing that I would say is passion. What I didn't know as a kid um, was that I should have been listening to myself care about the things that I cared about. So in my junior year of high school, I ran home and read The Grapes of Wrath in one sitting. It's 400 pages long, right? Rosa Sharon at the end. It was a rainy day. We had a test on Monday. How a kid who's 16 years old does not stop to pause, what does it mean that you actually could give a crap about physics, right? I was in the AP physics class and I could do the math and everyone said, oh, Walter, you're so good at math and science, you should be an engineer. So off I go to MIT and it wasn't until my junior year that I realized that I was running home to write film studies papers and was cracking the polymer physics book the night before the exam. So if you can somehow pay attention to what are the things that you love to do? And I don't know what thousands of accidents happen that allowed me to do this. I applied for engineering jobs when I graduated and to go to film school. And I got into film school. How I got into film school, I can't tell you. I think it had something to do with the fact that I had A's, B's, and C's in my engineering classes, and all A's and one B in my humanities classes. That might matter. Anyway, so I get in. I had the courage to go. I don't know how I did that. Yeah, right. Like, my father's got his house mortgaged three times. He's like, you're going to study what? <laughs> you know. So there's a lot of practical things you have to fight against. I see this all the time when, you know, high school parents, parents of high school students come in and say, so are there any jobs in film? I'm like, no. It used to be that, like, oh, go be an engineer. But with a crappy economy, that's not really jobs anywhere. Um, if you want to be a nurse, so if you can pass chemistry, um, and you know that you want to make money, nursing's for you. That's what I tell everyone. Because no matter how many nurses we crank out, there are not enough damn nurses. <laughs> so that's got to do with aging population and all this kind of stuff. Um, my nephew's a pharmacist. Uh, when he went to pharmacy school, it was the sweet spot. Like, everybody needs pills prescribed. Um, he leaves his pharmacy job every six months to get a $30,000 bonus. He works at Walgreens for three months, then he goes to, you know, Kmart. The guy's writing his own ticket. It seemed like that bubble was going to collapse, but they can't make pharmacy schools fast enough. So this bubble that was supposed to collapse about five years after he did that still hasn't collapsed. 
at some point, I would imagine there'd be enough pharmacists, but it hasn't happened anytime soon. Um, so that's the tactical thinking, that I'm going to do this thing because there's money in it. If you do the passion thing, um, it doesn't matter how much money's in it. The idea that I was going to become a humanities professor was preposterous. I was not a particularly good writer um, as a college student. Um, but you work hard because it doesn't seem like work. Like, I wrote this lecture yesterday and could not wait to get up this morning. I'm like, I get to go in and talk to students about research in the arts and humanities. That is worth its weight in gold. If you said to me, Walter, um, you're going to make $100 a week, <laughs> I'd be like, well, maybe I have to be an engineer to get food on my table. But it would be a hard call, right? Like it would be in the running. And so you have to listen to yourself. So what are you passionate about? So what's your major right now? Uh, I, I have two. Because yep. I'm passionate about both international studies yep. and engineering. OK, good. So more majors better than no majors. So in my junior year, as a materials major, um, I went to this Irish poet's office, because I loved his classes, and said, what if I got a humanities degree? He jumped out of his chair, because this never happens in MIT, and wandered around the university with me. Um, if I wouldn't have had two degrees, um, and my parents said, we cannot afford another semester. You're an eighth semester student, and that's it. So I took. Uh, the equivalent of 27 of your credits my senior year, both fall and spring. A lot of them were bullshitty credits. Like, I got nine credits to teach my philosophy professor's class. You know, there's all kinds of chicanery involved. Um, but, you know, we had uh, the 360 credits. It's not the same as your system, but 360 credits was what you needed for a bachelor's degree, and the double degree you needed at least 450. So I needed to get these other, whatever, 60 credits. Um, so, so I went out of my way to do this, and I'm glad I did. I, if I didn't have the two degrees, I wouldn't have been able to apply to engineering jobs, and I certainly wouldn't have gotten to graduate school, with, you know, in, in film school without a humanities degree. So I always talk to my students at the beginning. So take five classes and see how it goes. You're at a state university. Two of the classes are going to be jokes. Um, so see if you can handle six classes, and then see if you can handle seven. We've got people in our college that are triple majors. They're majors in all three of the departments in our college, journalism, radio, television, and cinema photography. Um, a really smart student should be able to pull that kind of stuff off. So you interrogate your own inventory. Like, if I took 18 credits a semester, would I be unhappy? Would I not be able to do other things that I want to do? But the inclination for a good student at a state university should be to take two majors because it gives you double the path, and then you'll learn what other people aren't learning, which is knowledge is not isolated, but it's cross-fertilized. That, that's what I'm trying to say here, right? Why does a film scholar need to know what salt is? Well, it so happens that you can talk about salt in movies if you know both those things. Um, so was it international relations and engineering? What kind of engineering? Uh, I'm currently okay. Um, so it sounds like a great combination. Um, my favorite science filmmaker um, made films about engineers without borders. So she went to Kenya and they dug a well and it was you know, all about this kind of like engaging in making the world better in an international venue. So I would think the first thing if I were you, um, I would go to the Engineers Without Borders website. That would be one thing that I think an international relations engineer might think about. Um, yeah, right. And like, you will gather skills in international relations that other engineers will not have, so that might open the doors for the kinds of things that you'd want to do in the future. Um, this is why you always tell people to do language majors. That, you know, if you're a business major um, and able to speak Arabic or Farsi, <laughs> that seems to be good if you want to get a job um, in the Middle East, right? So always build skills. You take your best guess about what skills they might be, but know that you can never guess right. And you have to rely on the fact that learning quantum mechanics was not useless to me. I'm a far better teacher 
because I was taught quantum mechanics. Because the students in quantum mechanics are like, I have no idea what's going on. How do you teach students that don't have any idea what's going on? That's a useful <laughs> teaching skill to have, you know. <laughs> so know that, trust your instincts. If the class seems terrible, it probably is terrible, drop it. <laughs> um, but if the class at least is of something of interest, even if you can't see its use value, stick with it because you might not know the use value for decades. The story I always tell is that my first job, my first academic job, was at Montana State University, um, and they said, can you teach theater? And when you're on a job interview, you're like, yes, sir, I have another? So of course I can teach theater. I spent the whole summer before the job started learning the history of theater. Um, my first lecture was on Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. In high school, I threw Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot across the room. It's about nothing and people blather on. I was so aggravated. What is this piece of crap? Twenty years later, the piece of crap bit me in the ass. It would have been better to have read Waiting for Godot in high school it wouldn't have taken me two weeks to prepare. It would have taken me a week over the summer. And I cursed my younger self for that. <laughs> That's what I mean by be open-minded. Like, who knows what you're going to learn from these people um, that know more than you do. Um, and you know, just think of all the things you learned today. Like, whatever it was, you got off your duff and said, I'm going to go to this talk. Um, research in the arts and humanities. I'm sure the history of salt was not the thing on your mind that you're going to learn about, right? Um, but sometimes it's those points of contact that allow students and professors to get into their own orbit. Um, MIT had this really cool thing. I've been trying to get SIU to do it. Um, they paired a small group of students <coughs> with a professor. So my guy in freshman year was Alan Guth. He's one of three early universe physicists. I sat in a room with Alan Guth for four years while he was an assistant professor. Now, whenever you turn on NOVA and it's about the early universe, Alan Guth, the full professor, is sitting there talking to you. So there's a perfect example of, you know, I, I, I looked at a bunch of things, like, what are you interested in? I'm like, eh, early universe, Big Bang, that seems like a thing I know about. And at the time, he was nobody. He was a second-year assistant professor. Um, you, know, you never know who these people are going to become. Um, and it's nice to be in on the ground floor. M my students, you know, from 20 years ago, are like, we read everything that you write. Because <laughs> they're in Hollywood and they don't have anyone to talk to. But I am a very different thinker and writer now than I was 20 years ago. So the fact that they followed along means that they've developed their own skills as a film scholar in concert with mine. All right. Have I blathered on too long here? Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs>